더 티핑 포인트 말콤 글라드웰 더 스티크니스 팩터 2 세사미 스트리트 이즈 더 베스트 논 포더 크리에이티브 주니어스 이즈 어트랙티드 피플 라이크 짐 헨손 앤조 래퍼소 앤 프랭크 오즈 우 인투이티블리 그래스프트 What it takes to get through to children They were television's answer to Beatrix Porter or L. Frank Baum or Dr. Seuss But it's a mistake to think of Sesame Street as a project conceived in a flash of insight What made us so unusual impact was to intend to which it was exactly the project of that. The intent to which the final product was deliberately and painstakingly engineered. The same street was built about a single breakthrough insight that if you can hold the attention of children, you can educate them. This may seem obvious, but it isn't. Many critics of television on this day argue that what dangerous about TV is that it's addictive, that children and even adults watch it like a zombie. According to this view, it's the formal features of television, violence, bright light, loud, and funny noise, quick editing cut, zooming in in and out, exaggerating action, and all the other things we associate with commercial TV that hold our attention. In other words, we don't have to understand what they are looking at or absorb what they are seeing in order to keep watching. That's what many people mean when they say that television is passive. We watch when you are simulated by world wizards and banks of the medium, and we look away and turn the channel when you are bored. What the pioneering television researchers of the 1960s and 1970s, in particular, Daniel Anderson at the University of Massachusetts, began to realize, however, is that this isn't how preschoolers watch TV at all. The idea was that kids would sit, stare at the screen, and join out. And Elibas Roach, the psychologist uh, amassed the college. But once we began to look carefully at what children were doing, we found out the short look were actually more common. There were much more variations. Children didn't just sit and stare. They could divide their attention between a couple of different activities, and they weren't being random. They were predictable influence on what made them look back at the screen, and these were not trivial things, not just a flash and that's it. Roche, for instance, once re-edited the episode of Sesame Street, so the certain key sense of some of the sketches were out of order. If kids were only interested in flesh and destiny, they wouldn't have made a difference. The show, after all, still had song and Muppet and bright color and action and all the things that make Sesame Street so wonderful. But it did make a difference. The kids stopped watching. If they couldn't make sense of what they were looking at, they weren't going to look at it. If in another experiment, Roach and Dan Anderson showed two group of five-year-old an episode of Sesame Street, the kids in the second group, however, were put in a room with lots of very attractive toys uh, on the floor. As you would expect, it, the kids in the room without the toys watch it, the show about 87% of the time, while the kids with the toys watch it only about 47% of the show. Kids 
기자 distracted by thoughts. But when they tested the two group of to see how much of the show the children remember and understand, the score was exactly the same. This result stunned the two researchers. Kids, they realized kids were a great deal more sophisticated in the way they watched than had been imagined. You were lead to the conclusion, they wrote. That the five-year-old in the toys group were attending quite strategically, distributing their attention between toy play and viewing so that they look at far for them were the most important informative part of the program. This strategy was so effective that the children could gain no more from increased attention. If you take these two studies together, the toys study and the editing study, you reach quite a radical conclusion about children and television. Kids often watch when they are stimulated and look away when they are bored. They watch when they understand and look away when they are confused. If you are in the business of educational television, this is a critical difference. It means if you want to know whether and what kids are learning from a TV show, all you have to do is to notice what they are watching. And if you want to know what kids aren't learning, all you have to do is notice what they aren't watching. Preschoolers are so sophisticated in their viewing behavior that you can determine the stickiness of children's programming by simple observation. The head of a researcher of Sesame Street in the early years was a psychologist from Oregon at Palmer whose specialty was the use of television as a teaching tool. When the children's television workshop was founded in the late 1960s, Palmer was a natural recruit. I was the only academic they could find doing such one children's TV, he said, in their lab. Palmer was given the task of finding out whether the elaborate educational curriculum that had been devised for Sesame Street by which academic advisor was actually reaching the show's viewers. It was a critical task. There were those involved with Sesame Street who say, in fact, that without Ed Palmer, the show would never have lasted through the first season. Palmer's innovation was something he called the distractor. He would play an episode of Sesame Street on a television monitor. He then run a slideshow on a screen next to it, showing a new slide every seven and a half second. We had the most varied set of slides we could imagine, said Palmer. We could have a body riding down the street with his arms out, a picture of a tall building, a leaf floating through ripples of water, rainbow, rainbow, a picture taken through a microscope, a Welsh drawing, anything to be noble that was the idea. Preschoolers would then brought into the room two at a time and told to watch the television show. Palmer and his assistants would sit slightly to the side with a pencil and paper, quietly noting when the children were watching Sesame Street and when they lost interest and looked instead at the slideshow. Every time the slide changed, Palmer and his assistants would make a new notation so that by the end of the show, they had almost a second by second account of what part of the episode being tested managed to hold the viewers' attention 
and what part did not? The distractor was a stickiness machine. The distractor was a stickiness machine. We'd take the big sized chart paper, two and three feet, and tape several of those sheets together. Palmer said, you had the data point. Remember, for every seven and a half seconds, which come to close to 400 data points for a single program, you need to connect all those points with a red line so it would look like a stock market report from Wall Street. It might plummet and gradually decline. And you'd say, wow, what's going on here? And other time, you might hug the very top of the chart then we'd say, oh, the segment really grabbing the attention of the kids. We tabulated those district scores in percentage. We'd have up to 100% sometimes. The average attention for most shows was around 85 to 90%. If the producers got that, they were happy. If they got about 50, they'd go back to the drawing board. Palmer tested other children's show, like the Tom and Jerry cartoon and Captain Kangaroo, and compared what section, what section of those shows worked with the far section of Sesame Street worked. Whatever Palmer learned, he paid back to the show's producer and writer so they could fine-tune and material accordingly. One of the standard myths about children's television, for example, had always been that kids love to watch animals. The producers would bring in a cat, or an antenna, or an otter, and show it and let it cover around. Palmer said they saw that would be interesting. But our distractor show that it was a bomb every time. A huge effort went in a Sesame Street character called a man from Alphabet, who especially was a punch. Palmer showed that kids hated him. He was candy. The, dis the distractor showed the no shine segment of the Sesame Street format should go beyond four minutes and the three minutes was probably optimal. He forced the producers to simplify dialogue and abandon certain techniques they had taken from adult television. We found, to our surprise, that our preschool audience didn't like it when the adult cast got into the contentious uh, discussion, he remembered. They didn't like it when two or three people would be talking at once. That's the producer's natural instinct to hype a scene by creating confusion. It's supposed to tell you that this is exciting. The fact is that our kids turned away from the kind of situation. Instead of picking up on a sig signal, that something exciting is going on. They pick up on the signal that something confusing is going on. And they do lose interest. After the third or fourth season, I'd say it was rare that we ever had a segment below 85%. We would almost never see something in the 50 to 60 percent range, and we we did we did fix it. You know, times turn about the survival of the fitness. We had a mechanism to ident identify the fitness and decide what should survive. We had a mechanism to identify the fitness and decide. What should survive?